And now <laughs> it's my immense honor to introduce our next speaker. Kacha Rislingbaldi, PhD, is a member of the Hoopa Valley tribe of Hapa, Karuk, and Yarok ancestry. I hope I said those right. The Associate Professor and Department Chair of Native American Studies at Humboldt State University, Dr. Baldi offers a sweeping overview and vision of Native people's leadership and how that's benefiting all peoples, including the return of Native lands. She co-founded the Native Women's Collective, a nonprofit that supports the revitalization of Native American arts and culture and researches indigenous feminisms, California Indians, and decolonization. She is the author of We Are Dancing For You, Native Feminisms and the Revitalization of Women's Coming of Age. It is our great joy and honor, with a deep bow of gratitude to Cara Romero and Alexis Bunton, to bring you the vision in action of Dr. Kacha Rissling Baldi. Hey, young everyone. It is a pleasure to join you today. Though we remain virtual, I'm happy to be here speaking with you from my home near Baduat in Wiat country. Just over 20 years ago, the Wiat people saw there was a small portion of their sacred island, Tuluat, for sale. Tuluat is located in Jarujiji where you sit and rest in what is currently called Eureka, California. It is the center of the Wiat world. It is a place of world renewal. And for over 100 years, it had been passed through ownership of various Humboldt County citizens, businesses, and finally to the city of Eureka. The small parcel that was for sale was expensive for the small tribe who had survived attempted genocide, removal, relocation, and finally termination. Wiat territory in Humboldt County includes most of the most populous town centers. Eureka is known as the county seat and is one of the most populous towns in the region. And in the region, we often refer to Eureka as the city. It's where the Costco and the Target are. The Wiat saw purchasing the small parcel for sale as a return to the center of the world. And one of their spiritual leaders, Cheryl Seidner, began bake sales and t-shirt sales and outreach so that they could raise enough money to purchase just some of their land back. In our area, Tuluat has most commonly been referred to as Indian Island. This is because on February 26th, 1860, Humboldt County citizens massacred more than 150 Wiat people who had just finished their world renewal ceremony to pray for the health and well being of the community and the world. Humboldt County citizens came with hatchets and knives. They murdered mostly Indian women and children. And this had been the last time the Wiat performed a world renewal ceremony on Tuluat. Until March 28, 2014, when the Wiat danced again, holding their first world renewal ceremony in over 150 years. And then this past year, October 2019, when the Wiat tribe had their island, their place of world renewal, returned to them from the city of Eureka. This was unprecedented. The joy in the room on that day when citizens from throughout Humboldt County gathered to celebrate the island's return to Wiat peoples was palpable. Wiat Tribal Chair Ted Hernandez stood before the room filled with hundreds of people and while holding back tears he spoke, quote, this has been an intergenerational movement to heal the island, the health of our people, to heal our community. Today, we make history together. We change the story. Today is the day of pride for the city of Eureka. Today is Tuluat, the return of the Wiat people 
today the Wiat people who have lived in this area since the time and memorial return to the center of their Wiat world. And we do this together with the city of Eureka." End quote. Today I am here with you virtually from Wiat territory, very near Baduat, or what is currently called McKinleyville, California. I am Hupa Yorak and Karuk, and enrolled in the Hupa Valley tribe. I grew up here in our Aboriginal territories, swimming in our rivers, gathering in our hills, eating acorns that my mother would take us to gather each year. She taught me how to gather, process, cook, and eat acorns. She told me about how at one time, federal government agencies proposed cutting down our oak trees so that they could stop us from eating acorns. It was profit to them. It was also a way to push us further from the connections to our land and our histories and our strong indigenous futures. We are nourished from the land and the land knows us. We introduce ourselves when we gather. We scatter tobacco and we say a prayer and we tell the land and trees and the plants and all of our more than human relatives, thank you for what they provide for us, for what they teach us throughout our lifetimes. According to the Sacred Land Film Project, indigenous peoples are 4% of the world's population, live on 22% of the earth's surface. And on that land is 80% of the planet's remaining biodiversity. The International Journal of Wildland Fire found that indigenous cultural burning practices are some of the most beneficial for forest management. And they quote, reduce fuel loads by 23 to 78% without changing the structure of the forest and they decrease tree mortality, end quote. Research also shows that indigenous peoples achieve conservation results at least equal to those of government run protected areas, often with a fraction of the budget. Another study showed that from 2000 to 2012, the annual deforestation rates in the Amazon were two to three times lower for lands that were held by indigenous peoples. As the Rainforest Alliance declares, the message is clear Indigenous peoples know best how to protect their forests. Now we are facing what we see as a critical time, one where climate change could irreversibly damage our planet and force us to make changes that we have been putting off for a long time. We can only do this with Indigenous peoples at the center of how we understand our place in the world. Our knowledge of this place was created before time began. And over the thousands upon thousands, potentially over 100,000 years in California alone, we have been observing and building a relationship to this land that is based on reciprocity, respect, and relationship. Our knowledge is thousands upon thousands of years of scientific experimentation. We look at the ecosystem as interconnected and we have long-term data about what changes mean for our plants, our rivers, our salmon relatives. The Red New Deal, written by the Red Nation in response to and in addition to the Green New Deal, reminds us that if we are going to move past this climate crisis, we are not going to do that without also dismantling settler colonialism a view of the world that sees it only as profit, as resource, and as object. When we talk about decolonization, that is the centering of indigenous voices in our work, our plans, on our boards, in our organizations, in a meaningful way that works for the return of land. Yes, the first step is the return of land. I promised you today three steps 
to Reimagining Climate and Environmental Justice in California. My goal here is to move people toward action that is powerful, meaningful, visionary, and makes the impossible possible. I work to help people radically imagine what our decolonized futures can be. Because as Eve Tuck and Kay Wayne Yang note, decolonization cannot be a metaphor. It is not about decolonizing our minds or our bookshelves or our syllabus or our garden. It is about the return of indigenous land and life. It is about a world we build with relationship, reciprocity, and respect. It is at first hard to imagine. In our settler colonial capitalistic society, we haven't been given the space or the tools to imagine a world beyond settler colonialism and capitalism. I've heard scholars who point out that we have an easier time of imagining what we will do in a zombie apocalypse than we do imagining what the end of capitalism looks like. We believe these to be permanent structures, something that we cannot even imagine the world without. We aren't armed with tools to imagine a future beyond settler colonial logics like heteropatriarchy, dehumanization, terra nullius, and destruction of land, or the people and more than human relatives that live with us here. But in indigenous cultures, we dream the world into being. It is our stories, our dreams, our songs, our late night conversations that build the world as it could be. Native peoples have been theorizing and using radical imagination for radical decolonized futures since the beginning of time. We have been given the tools to radically imagine how to build our futures. We dream them, we sing them, we story them into being. We have always done this and we must begin again. So I know that it usually begins by hearing someone say out loud, what could be or what should be. I like to think about the ways in which we can speak things into being together. And I usually take it upon myself to do this in many of the spaces in which I enter. I imagine a new world, a world without dams, a world where salmon is healthy and where we can all drink the water and where we all have food and where the land is vibrant and a world where we can all breathe. But how do we get there? And what can we do right now? Step one, give the land back. Now you might think she's coming in hot and I am. I'm coming in hot because I think that we have to say the biggest things out loud. What do our radical futures really look like? Sometimes people think that decolonization is supposed to be a straight line. I always say decolonization is a starburst. It bursts out in multiple directions, creating something amazing in an instance. Once we start to dream it together, it can come into being just like that, like a burst of light. At the heart of this decolonization has to be your land return. We don't need to think about that as the last step, like after we've decolonized our minds, our curriculums, our statues, our books, our movies, our TV shows, our clothing, then maybe we'll finally get to the return of land. I say, let's start with the return of land and know that it's possible and it's powerful and that it's going to be the thing that changes the world. If you woke up today and you thought, how can I change this world? I gave you the answer, give the land back. 
Land back is the momentous dreaming, the centering of our shared reimagining. Land back is about our shared futures, but it's also about putting the world back into balance. Many of us don't know very much about the land, the places in which we inhabit or occupy, or even about land and ownership in the United States. 59.9% of land in the US is owned by private owners. White Americans own more than 98% of US land, which amounts to 856 million acres with a total worth of over $1 trillion. However, on the West Coast of the United States, land is primarily owned by the federal government. 45.3% of California is federal land. When we talk about where can we start, why not start with our federal lands, which we all know could use the extra support and management by indigenous tribes. What about the large donations of land that often go to organizations or universities? What if those became part of our land return futures? When land is returned, we see better futures in action. We feel it, we live it. This is the hope of all generations. Now step two, support our work. Supporting indigenous people's work and voices is not performative. It has to be structural. We need structural changes to bring us to the table as the experts and the nations that we are. It should not be Native American studies departments that have to struggle to maintain their place in higher education, but we do. It should not be Native students that struggle against a system where they are constantly confronted every day with structural racism, but they do. It should not be Native peoples who are always on the front lines, making carpool lists to attend public meetings and hearings where they testify for three minutes before a board, where they're told that their voices are only one of many, but we do. We need the structural support to do our good work that we've been doing grassroots for over 500 years of colonization. Many times indigenous peoples are treated as stakeholders, invited along with other stakeholders to make three minute testimonies before boards or commissions. Yet we are not invited to be on the board or on the commission. We are not given the space to make or affect real structural change. As I always say to people, consultation is not collaboration. Indigenous peoples should be partners, and at the heart of that partnership should be land return. That is at the heart of what we should all be doing today and beyond. Now, step three is easy. Repeat steps one and two. Work for land return and support the work that we do to build opportunities for indigenous futures and land return. It's time for a radical education, to dream big, to know that impossible things are possible. When the Wiat people said, we want our island back, the center of our world, they were told that's impossible. When they held bake sales and t-shirt sales, they were told that's impossible. When they proposed it to the Eureka City Council, when they began negotiations, when they held candlelight vigils and finally had their first world renewal ceremony in over 150 years, still people said, that's impossible. I have seen impossible things happen in my lifetime. On the day that Tuluat was returned to the Wiat, Tribal Chair Ted Hernandez closed his speech with a call out to indigenous youth. He said, quote, 
Today is something that you witnessed in history. Today is your day to move forward with our traditions and our cultures. We don't stop here moving forward. And the next part is the healing of our rivers, to bring back our rivers. Across California, impossible things are being made possible. The return of land, the undamming of rivers, these things are happening in multiple communities right now. PG&E donated 2,325 acres of land to the Maidu Summit Consortium. The Yurok tribe had 50,000 acres of land in Blue Creek, a tributary of the Klamath River returned to them from the Green Diamond Resource Company. The Sograate Land Trust, which is working throughout the Bay Area, had a quarter acre parcel of land in Oakland, transferred to them in 2019. This moment demands our radical imaginings and our radical push for new futures. This we can build together. So let's go. Thank you, everyone.